pleasure to work. Let's give Mr. Porter a great welcome to give us a really very personal young woman's emotion lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, this Gosha, uh, they're going to do today can very easily be misunderstood. And if you misunderstand it, you might get terribly angry with me and mention my show. So I'm really hoping that at the end you can give me a good clap and uh, not a beating. This version we're doing, as you see, is entitled A Letter to Nietzsche Show. It's in volume three, for those of you who want to check in your books. Uh, page 49 to 53 is the part we're taking tonight. Page 49 to 53 in volume three. How's the sound? Okay. So, let's begin. It was Mitchell Dachan himself who named this lady, to whom the Gosha was addressed, Michio Shona. And as we know, the word Shona means someone revered and particularly wise, because that is also the title given to all the high priests of Michio Shona. Now, you can imagine that this lady was really something. And she was also very young when she was given this time. So, uh, Nietzsche, of Nietzsche Dio, Nietzsche means the sun. The same Nietzsche that is in the word Nietzsche. So, in given a title with the word Nietzsche, it is also uh, given to many of the high priests. Uh, this means close relationship with the Buddha, which is Russian. And Myo is the Myo of Myo Hore Nye Kyo. Myo, that is to say, that unseen, purifying power of life force. The energy, the pure energy of life. Myo of Myo Hore Nye and shonen uh, means a sage, an extremely wise person. And it is understood within that title, shonen, that that person will become a Buddha. So Nietzsche will show you, a young lady, uh, in being given that title by Nietzsche will show you, the shonen is saying, without the shadow of doubt, you will obtain Buddha. So, as you will discover, as we go through this discussion, Nietzsche showed had incredible deep faith, and she also had tremendous courage. This is why Nietzsche Vashon gave her such an honor. And in the end, towards the end of this Gosha, Nietzsche Vashon says, you are undoubtedly foremost voted Lotus Sutra mm -hmm. among the women of Japan. You are undoubtedly the foremost voter of the Lotus Sutra among the women of Japan. It's very re relevant to our present time uh, and quite surprising in a way, considering those times, that Nietzsche uh, Yoshona was a single mother. That is to say, she had been married at a very young age and uh, at a very young age, we don't know exactly what age, at a very young age, she became separated from her husband. And uh, at that time, shortly after her separation, she had her first baby, who was called Oto. Oto, 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 So in those days, it was lifespan, of course, was much shorter. Probably the average age of people in Japan in those times, and also in Europe, was around about 55 or 58. And it seems when the lifespan is shorter, that maturity is that much sooner, both physical and spiritual maturity. And so most girls in those days were already married by the time they were 13 or 14. 
So uh, at the time this version was written, probably uh, she was around about 15 or 16 years old. It was very, very exciting. For how amazing being given the title Richard of Show by the true brother at the age of 15 or 16. It's an incredible thought, isn't it? However, in Japanese society, those medieval times, uh, being separated or divorced was considered a disgrace. So, in society itself, as a single mother, she must have been really strong. What moved me to write this letter was that she made the long and very difficult a dangerous journey from Kamakura in the mainland to Sado Island on her own, carrying a new baby in her arms in order to see the transition. You took that journey, as we understand it, uh, anything between something like 12 days or more to a month because of the problem with the seas and the rough seas, the boats wouldn't sail. And added to that, there were great dangers on the way. So for a young person of this age, it was an immense undertaking. And the incredible thing for a woman on her own in those medieval times. <coughs> so Richard Dyson wrote this scholarship to her from Southern Ireland uh, after she'd visited, made this long journey, visited, and after she'd gone back home. And the actual date of the letter is the 25th of May. 1272, 25th of May, 1272. So he wrote the letter on Saturday in exile after Richard Rochelle had visited. Later, a few years later, when Richard Rochelle returned to the mainland and retired to Mount Minot, Richard Rochelle made a second journey. And that wasn't all that easy either in those days to visit him in Mount Minot. Particularly dangerous because it was in the midst of the civil war which was taking place between various clans, families at that particular time in Japan. So the countryside was dangerous, it was filled with mar marauders, and uh, the people were starving because of the terrible state of the economy as a result of all the natural disasters that were being occurred, as well as civil war on top. And it was just before, six months before, the Mongols made their first invasion of Japan. So in deep, deep gratitude and in, in intense admiration for her faith and for her seeking spirit, Nichiren Daishonin wrote a second letter to her after he visited, she visited him in Mount Earth. Now this goes to the second one, it's also in volume three, if you want to read, uh, and it's called The Supremacy of the Law. The Supremacy of the Law in volume three. And in that particular version, uh, Mitchell Dyson showed his feeling for her because he wrote in it, should any calamity before us, of course referring to invasion by the Mongols, should any calamity before us, you should immediately come to visit me here, where you will be welcomed wholeheartedly. Should the worst happen, then let us starve together among these mountains. I would imagine your great daughter, Oak, has now become a fine and intelligent little girl. So, you can see from that, too, how much you can imagine the character of this young lady. This particular version has three parts. The first part I'm not going to deal with today. Uh, it is in fact consists of seven stories that were told by Shakyamuni. Stories such as, for instance, Sesame, uh, which you all know because you've seen Alice and you know the Jabberwock is his alias, the monster or demon in the story of Sesame. Uh, the reason that Shri Bhajan told these, or retold these seven stories, all of which were contained in the provisional sutras of Chapman, was that he wanted to emphasize the incredibly severe practices 
which uh, believers had to undergo when they were following Shaman in Buddhism. Uh, and these stories all uh, consist of tales, such as Sesamboji jumping into the mouth of the demon, or someone else tearing off their skin in order to buy paper for the Buddhist verse to be written on and so on. Uh, and in the second part of the version, the middle part, he goes on to say to Michigan, of course, in these days, such severe practices and austerities are no longer necessary. And it is rather more effort and devotion, such as the Nietzsche of Shoney's journey to Saddle Island, which is the equivalent, which is an incredible force and ensures the enlightenment of that person in one life. Through chanting, number one. And in the third part of the verse, he praises Nietzsche of Shoney with strong faith. So that gives you a sort of background to what we're going to be considering. Now, our last sound will begin to read. Just as a commoner can become a king, so can an ordinary person become a Buddha instantly. This is the heart of the doctrine of each and every sound. Very short, isn't it? Just as a commoner can become a king, so can an ordinary person become a Buddha instantly. This is the heart of the doctrine of Hitchin and Sunday. It's a very short phrase, but it's incredibly and deeply meaningful. There's a theory called Hitchin and Sunday. 3,000 states of life, or 3,000 worlds in every moment of our existence. This theory, which was taught originally by Tiantai the Great, teaches us that we express whatever world, in terms of the ten worlds, whatever world we are in, through the ten factors. Uh, those ten factors being the ones who decide to belong here every day, those are so and those are shown, those are time and so on. So you are expressing whatever world it may be, for example, and through those ten factors, uh, with immense power and effect. We often can't see it, but in fact, our lives are incredibly powerful in terms of the uh, extent of their influence. And of course, I'm not just talking about influence through talking, or influence through shouting, but influence through the vibrations which our lives send out. So let's just consider for a moment those ten factors. No say so means the appearance, your outward appearance and action. No say so means your nature or spiritual life. No say tai means the very core or heart of it. Nyose Riki means the power of your life. Nyose Sa means the influence resulting from that power. Nyose In is the inherent cause of your actions. And Nyose En is the external cause which you make arising from that internal, inherent cause. Nyose Ka is the latent effect which results from the cause. You make a cause immediately the effect is lodged in your life. And Nyose Ho is the manifest effect when the effect actually appears on the surface of the life. And finally, we say Nyose Homma Kukyoto. Homma Kukyoto is absolute consistency from beginning to end. In other words, if you're in the world of anger, you express that anger through those ten factors with absolute consistency from beginning to end. If your life crashes 
snatch away from anger and emptiness, hunger or hell, and equally that world that you're in expresses itself with absolute persistence. Your whole life for that moment expresses that anger with unbelievable power, though that power, of course, can't necessarily be seen. But nevertheless, subconsciously, it is felt by everybody around you and by every thing around But this is the power with which our every action affects everything in our environment. Quite an awesome thought in a way, isn't it? But equally, of course, if you're in the state of Buddha, then you're expressing Buddha with that incredible power. And this is why and how we get conspicuous benefits, for example, from our environment. Because our life expresses that Buddha with such amazing power. And therefore, uh, things in one's environment, <coughs> maybe one's parents, or one's boyfriend, or one's bank manager, whatever, or one's boss, reacts in a way which is the best way in your life. So, Nietzsche and I should be taught, didn't we? When we're in Buddha, this happens instantaneously. The moment we chant Nanda the moment we chant Nanda we are in the state of Buddha. You cannot chant Nanda without being in the state of Buddha. So therefore, though you may not do it, the moment you chant Nanda your life is in the state of Buddha and you are expressing Buddha through those ten facts. Both inwards into yourself and outwards into your environment with incredible power. So therefore, for example, when we chant, maybe at the beginning we can't get comfortable. Our legs ache, and the last thing we feel is very good of it. But of course, one must remember that this theory of Nietzsche and Sunset also points out that within the state of Buddhism are all the other one world. So still within Buddha, though Buddha is the main tendency, still there is anger, hunger, hell, love, and so on in one's, in one's life. So even though your legs may ache and you may feel distress, even though you may even feel irritated, you may be saying to yourself when you start to chant, oh dear, no, I haven't got to speak to catch any trouble in five minutes' time. You know, really, I'd much prefer to be cooking my meal or having another cup of coffee or whatever. Or if I do this coffee, I'm not going to be able to take it. So is it. Sometimes you get so irritated. Even though uh, we're like that, Still, that action, if we're chanting on the way to in the state of Buddha. And it may seem incredibly slow when we first start to chant. We chant for five minutes and think, I've got to say a word. <laughs> Looking at our watch all the time. But then suddenly, if we're chanting, say, for half an hour, suddenly, we're aware. Something happens. All those little irritations thought disappear. Suddenly we find we've chanted the remaining 20 minutes of that not good in what seemed like about 30 seconds. But that of course is because you purify the life by the chanting and the other nine worlds that are within the world of the world is clear out. Buddha is really running full of love. But the point is that Buddha really is actually running full of love in the first time you open your mouth and chant. This is what Richard Rush is. But this is why people are 
we say no. You must trust the Lord. You must trust the fact that if you're chanting none of it, you're in for it. You must try hard to stop worrying, 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 worrying. worrying. Well, thinking about it, of course you may be 
and for what it is we have to do in order to achieve the solution to that problem. Do you want to understand? Okay, let's move on. The next paragraph. How then do we take this benefit? Should we peel off our skins and feel what we want to be here? Follow us as a third example and offer our bodies to a demon or emulate what is happening in that room and bring our others. As a great teacher, Chan Nan stated, you should distinguish between the Shoju and Shakabu methods and never adhere solely to one or the other. What practice one should perform in order to master the true law and attain Buddhahood depends upon the times. Were there no paper in Japan, you should peel off your skin. Had the Lotus Sutra not yet been introduced to our country, and the only individual to appear who knew it was a demon, then you should offer your body to him. Were there no, were, were there no oil available in our land, then you should burn your elbows. But of what use is it to peel off one's skin when the country is abundantly supplied with excellent paper? Thank you. Uh, here I mentioned my is referring back to those stories which he told at the beginning of the version. They're not really good tonight. There's stories about the severe cause practices or austerities, the causes that you had to make over lifetime after lifetime in order to attain Buddhahood uh, through the teachings, the early teachings of Japanese and Buddha. And of course, he's leading up to that point where he reaffirmed this age, uh, through the practice, chanting money on this day, you can attain Buddha in one month. And the sort of efforts, the sort of practices that one has to do are not as large as severe as they were uh, in, in the eons of earlier ages. So uh, he mentions the great teacher, Chan An, Chan An. Chan An was the chief disciple of Tiantai the Great, who taught the theory of the Chen Tung. And one point that needs explaining, he says, as the great teacher Chan'an stated, you should distinguish between the Shoju and Shakabuku members and never adhere solely to one or the other. So here, you, some of you will have met the word Shoju before, but this Shoju is a different uh, this shoju is not actually a method of propagation, which is usually the meaning of the word shoju. Uh, we, we know that there is shoju and shakabuku, two different methods of propagation, and that it's shoju that we use in this country, but that it's a non this country, and this is propagation by means of uh, discussion, persuasion, and example. So, uh, that is what's called the method of shoujo. But this shoujo is a different character. And the character uh, means seeking the law for one's own enlightenment, as opposed to propagating it to others. You got it. This shoujo means seeking the law for one's own enlightenment, as opposed to propagating it to others. So it's, it's, it's funny, but it's sort of the opposite of the character of Shoju, uh, which concerns the method of propagation. When Nichiren Dashan says that, you should never adhere solely to one or the other. Shakabuku is propagation, seeking the law of propagating it. Shoju, in this meaning, is seeking the law, but keeping it to yourself. Nichiren Dashan says that. You should never hear so one or the other. So there, he's saying to Nichiren Dashan that his Buddhism, Nichiren Dashan's Buddhism, is the Buddhism of what's called Jigyo and Keita. Jigyo, J-I-G-Y-O, means practice for yourself, and Keita, K-E-T-A, means practice for others. You should not adhere solely to one or the other, he says. In other words, you should practice both in the heart. Practice for yourself and practice for others. So, in other words,
other person, which is by simply explain the practice or actions for yourself and actions for others are a natural rhythm of life. If you look at nature, for example, no, no uh, living, living organism in nature is practicing for itself alone. Every insect, bird, plant is serving another organism in one way or another. Insects provide food for birds. Birds sit on rhinoceroses and bats and pick up the insects that cause them trouble in their skin. Little fish get inside the mouths of sharks and clean their teeth and so on. Everything is serving something else. And human beings should be no exception. Human beings also should live lives which are geographical, practicing for themselves and also for others in a perfect rhythm of harmony. So, uh, the proof of the pudding is that if we only practice for ourselves, some of you may have experienced this way. We get a sort of state of stagnation. It doesn't matter how hard or how much we chant by mocking. If we are only practicing for ourselves, our lives will somehow get heavier, and we will feel they're not moving, that everything is stale and stagnant. Now, equally, the opposite extreme, if we practice only for others, of course, that is a trap too, because we are fine. When we're neglecting ourselves, we're doing activities all the time, no directions, but we're totally forgetting to look at ourselves and to challenge our own human evolution. So therefore, the correct practice is that perfect plan to practice for yourself and practice for others. So this is why Mitchell Dyson said the practice is gone by not good. And Shakti. Study, of course, the third thing supports both. Basically, Gong Yon Dhanaku and Shakti. Practice for yourself and practice for others. But in actual fact, even within those two categories, Gong Yon Dhanaku is in fact also for others, isn't it? We do Gong Yon, we chant Dhanaku, and always we include others, or we should be. The natural tendency. And actually, equally, of course, with Shakti. We do shakabuku to give happiness to others and to help them to overcome their suffering. But at the same time, of course, it's helping us to change our karma that we discover. And therefore, we get benefit from doing shakabuku. So this is, by all things in Buddhism, isn't it? It's also beautifully, perfectly balanced and round. Nothing is one way. Everything is always two ways. And therefore, there's no such thing as sacrifice in Buddhism. Now this, too, is the reason why uh, the discussion is called the prime activity of Mitchell Chosha Sutta. Gondor and of course, is our individual practice. And this, of course, should become a regular and steady but so far as activities, close movement are concerned, activities for shut the book, the discussion movement is the prime activity. And the reason for that is it is the battlefield of practice of others. Without the discussion movement, you have no battlefield. I call it a battlefield because of the discussion movement place where you have to challenge your human revolution. There you are having to uh, harmonize your life with a group of people who perhaps in the normal circumstances you'd never think of making your friends. But they are all human beings. And of course you gradually know that you're practicing Buddhism. But you can't find other people without making bad choices. You have to tolerate the differences see in them as compared to yourself. And you have to not only tolerate the 
differences that we all recognize, but those differences are very important because they have their own unique mission or purpose in life, and you have yours. So truly, the discussion district or group left is the battlefield of the human revolution. It's the place where we have to begin to do it. If we escape from discussion meetings, it means we're escaping from doing our human revolution. You follow? So this is why so much emphasis is placed on attending discussion meetings and supporting them, and why we should all encourage our shut group unfailingly to attend decisions. Otherwise, if we are failing them, we will be delaying their human evolution and the acceleration of their growth in faith, which we did not encourage to go to discussion meetings. And that's the reason for their existence. Okay, if that's all clear so far, we can go on. Right. <laughs> Standing during the 11th year of the search for law for 17 years, having a distance of 100,000 leagues, then here remained in China for over two years. We travelled 3,000 leagues from the Dinamic Sea to Arlanta. They were both men, sages and worthy of that, and there to the more virtuous age. Never have I heard of a woman who journeyed a thousand leagues in search of Buddhism as he did. True, the dragon king's daughter attained enlightenment without changing the dragon form, and the nun, Mahapati, received a prediction that she would become a Buddha in the future. But I am not certain, sorry, I am not certain that they may be female forms assumed by the Buddha or Bodhisattvas. After all, those events occurred in the Buddha's lifetime. This paragraph, the most important lines, are the last two. I am not certain, but they may have been female forms assumed by Buddhas or Bodhisattvas. After all, those events occurred in the Buddha's lifetime. So here, we're coming down to the point in the Gosha where Nichiren Vajon is emphasizing the, the great difference between his Buddhism and Shakyamuni's Buddhism. And that difference in specifically in terms of what it teaches to women and for women. So this is why, of course, this version is a very interesting one in the point of view of women. He says, they never would have true the dragon king's daughter attained enlightenment without changing her dragon form. And the nun, Mahaprajapati, received the prediction that she would become a woman in the future. I am not certain, he said, that they may have been female forms assumed by Buddhas or Bodhisattvas, in other words, males. After all, those events occurred in the Buddha's life. What is leading up to, of course, is that in Shatamuni's Buddhism, until he taught the Lotus Sutra, women couldn't attain enlightenment, and nor could intellectuals. All the provision of the early sutra taught that women and men of the two vehicles, as they're called, intellectuals, couldn't attain Buddhism. And it wasn't until he taught the Lotus Sutra, Shatamuni taught the Lotus Sutra, eight years before he died, that he actually changed everything and said, women can attain the life equally as men. So it's worth examining you know, why this was the case. So even in the case of two examples, such as the dragon's king's daughter, and this nun called Maha, very difficult to pronounce. Uh, even there, where it seemed on the surface that ah, at last, you know, women can attain enlightenment. But even there, there was a hint that these two women who attain enlightenment actually were Buddhas and Bodhisattvas, in other words, men who were appearing in female form. 
eternity, eternal life. However, when the legislature Shadman has said, discard, Thomas will discard all my previous teachings. So in other words, it was a complete reversal. And he specifically then said that the nature of the men of two bills and women who couldn't pay the night and anticipate it, anyone else could. So, however,
sense is teaching the inferiority of being. And this goes back even further, in terms of religion, of course, anyway, so far as the Bible is concerned, the original story of Adam and Eve that some would read about. <laughs> so, uh, women, woman, uh, was looked upon as the temptress who could lead man through his desires, or as they call it, the lusts of the flesh, and through that, we should be in control. In other words, these religions were man's defense against his own natural sexual desires. And what a mess it's got the world in at the moment. The expression of women's power, of love and compassion, has a lot to do with the imbalance that exists in the world today and the state of the present. In other words, humanity is out of balance because historically the pure power of compassion and love of women has not been released. So, of course it's true that women can use this power wrong, as I'm sure you all do. They can use that power of love Ends, they can use it possessively. Of course they can. Everything that is in teaching has a positive and a negative side. And it can do all those things that men were worried about. It can weaken them. It's all. But on the other hand, the censor said in the book called The Creative Family, if women could direct their great power love and compassion outwardly towards others rather than only inwardly for their own selfish needs, then they could save the whole world from their own. So of course it's a vicious circle, like all these things are in this human body. Of course women were suppressed, because they couldn't develop their strengths, therefore their constant worry was secure. Therefore there was this tendency try to hang on to everything, make a secure world in which we can live and withstand any bad happenings that might occur in the future. So it arose this tendency out of fear. So now let's take it a step further, and this is why I said, don't get upset when you read the next paragraph, because what Richard Dyson is doing is list out some of the negative aspects of the nature of women, as expounded in the provisional sutras of Shabbat A woman's nature differs from a man's, just as a fire differs from water, fire being hot and water cold. Fishermen are skilled in catching fish, and hunters are proficient in trapping deer. A sutra states, that it is a woman's nature to be jealous, but no sutra says that women are good at seeking Buddhism. A woman's mind is compared to a breeze. Even if it were possible to bind the wind, no one, one can never grasp a woman's mind. A woman's mind is like the magnets of characters written on the surface of water. They do not, not remain for a moment. A woman is compared to a lion. One cannot tell. <coughs> Whether a lion's words are true or false, a woman's mind is compared to a river, for all rivers to be angry. So, these are the various things, uh, or some of the various things, that are said about women in the traditional sutras. And Richard Bajerman is listing these here. Uh, these, as I said, are the negative sides of the woman's nature. And Richard Bajerman begins by saying, of course, Woman's nature does differ from man's. Dust is fire differs from water. Fire is hot, water is cold. Of course there's a difference. We all know that. Physiologically and psychologically, inevitably, woman's nature is different from man's. It's the fact of life, just as 
and says, it's a fact of life that fishermen are skilled in catching fish. So, uh, these various points he then makes, but it's only so that he can go on to point out the way the religion in the beginning of the next paragraph, the Chakabuni, then when he taught the Lotus Soup, said, discard, honestly discard all the provision of teaching. And stated in the Lotus Sutra that he can protect the Buddha. So this was an, an about face, but it was in fact the Shakyamuni Buddha preparing the uh, way for the future, the phenomenon of the Buddha. So maybe we're going straight away and read this. The Lotus Sutra, however, is a teaching which contains Shakyamuni's declaration that he was now honest to discard the provisional teaching. It is a sutra of which Tama Buddha says, All that you, Shakyamuni Buddha, have expounded is the truth. It demands that his believers be honest and upright, gentle in mind, gentle, peaceful, and upright, and so on. Those who believe in this sutra, therefore, must have minds which are as straight as Tight stretched bowstring, or a carpenter's eating line. One may call it the right sound of it, but it will not have the sound of its fragrance. A lion never becomes a truthful person simply because one tells him, one calls him out. All the sutras are the Buddha's golden teachings, his true words. When compared with the Lotus Sutra, however, they are false, flattering, abusive, or forked at times. The Lotus Sutra alone is the truth of truths. Only honest people are able to take faith in this sutra, the teaching free of all falsehood. Certainly, you are a woman of true words. Uh, see, here mentioned by Shannon is, is explaining the difference in Buddhism uh, from the time of the Lotus Sutra onwards. And in the Lotus Sutra, uh, believers, both men and women, uh, are said be gentle, peaceful, and upright. I hope we all are. And only honest people are able to take faith in this sutra, because the Lotus Sutra states. So what does this mean? Only honest people are able to take faith in this sutra. That's to say, if you practice the Lotus Sutra, which is practicing, of course, none of them will be to the gods, then you have to be willing to face yourself, don't you? You can't fool the gods. You can't sit in front of the gods and not face yourself. Sometimes we try to. Sometimes when we think we're going to see something we don't like about ourselves, until someone reminds us, we may discover we spent six weeks chanting the gods and are never looking at them. But actually, we have to look at the gods, and we have to prepare to see you know, ourselves as it's put, warts and all, don't we? So this means being honest. We have to be honest if we practice the gods, because we never do. We have to go out with the revolution. So that is the meaning of being honest. Honestly acknowledging the negativity of existence, discovering it, seeing it, acknowledging it, and returning it to change. The whole process of the big revolution is here. So finally, Nichiren Dachan uh, then goes on to praise Nichiren, and uh, it's worth reading that last two paragraphs. It's a little bit going over time. Do you mind if I go on for about seven minutes more? No. Is it okay? Sorry. Think of it. Even were one to meet a person who could cross the ocean carrying Mount Suru on his head, one could never find a woman like you. Even though one might find a person who could steam salmon and make boiled rice of it, one could never meet a lady of your virtue. Let it be known that Shakyamuni Buddha, Parma Buddha, all the Buddhas of the Ten Directions, great Bodhisattvas, such as Jogyo and Mohenjo, Bonten, Taishaku, the Father of the and other deities who protect you and be with you always, just as a shadow accompanies the body. You are a blood 
Thank you. 
Certainly, somehow, get me to the 21st century. <laughs>